we're actually just playing with it. we're playing with Docker in, in, in a research facility. So um, I'm going to give you a very, very quick whirlwind tour of some of one of the things we're doing with Docker in bioinformatics. Now, a quick, quick show of hands. Who actually has heard of bioinformatics and do you know what we guys, what we do? Okay, a couple, that's all right. Um, so I'm here today with Amos. He's sitting in the front uh, there. We're, we're senior bioinformaticians at a group that works down at the King's College of Denmark Hill. We're affiliated uh, with uh, the NHS. We work at a mental health hospital and also King's College Hospital. So we kind of deal with everything. We're, we're a, a unit that kind of straddles um, real-world patient data. It's translational re uh, research dealing with data of kind of anything you can think of that you can measure on a human being gets thrown our way and we do stuff with it. That's, that's basically bioinformatics. Um, it's an umbrella term for a lot of different fields of computer science or computational biology. So it's, we're getting a lot of current involvement now in, in text mining uh, medical records. So just pulling out structured data, well, pulling out data from unstructured data, so free text that clinicians like to write and then sticking in the database whacking it through a uh, analysis package and just showing something. Um, I'm going to talk about some next generation sequencing today. And, and if you look at the wiki entry of, of uh, bioinformatics, it kind of covers all sorts of stuff. We're uh, kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to data an analysis in, in our team and some of the stuff that we do. Uh, again, our focus is translational bioinformatics. And again, that's another umbrella term for dealing with data from a patient and actually what we're tasked with is um, trying to make a difference in healthcare with real world data. Um, and we do lots of things called clinical genomics, uh, genomic medicine, pharmacogenomics, genetic epidemiology, and this is all basic biostats and machine learning for biomarker discovery. Uh, genomic medicine is, is anything to do with DNA and your genes on a patient measuring anything. Um, and we're kind of a, a, a ragtag team, and there's a lot of DevOps, and you know, Amos is involved in leading the software development side of the team. And about a year ago, he said, Steve, take a look at Docker. For about three months, I ignored it, and then uh, went, oh shit, actually, this is a, this is a great thing for us. Um, I'm speeding because we're running out of time, but th this is literally what we do. Uh, if you want to check out our website, it's, it's under a, a constant, you know, it's evolving. Um, so this is it. So our day job, when it comes down to it, is, is, is we put together pipelines. So we stitch together tools. Uh, download resources, so various things that you need to get that tool running, uh, annotation files, metadata, resource like that. And it, it's, it gets big. So it's literally we get accused downloading the internet sometimes, and, and we get to the point. We test the tools, we put them together, orchestration, uh, move into Kubernetes at some point. Amos is having a, a good play with that at some point. Test and validate the pipelines, improve, sale, and eventually the real thing we want to get to is we want to do biology, translation biology. We want to do something with the data, feed it back to the clinicians uh, or even the, uh, the commerce fellows and tell them how they can save money. Um, and this term I came across recently, yak shaving, who's heard of this? This is literally a better description of actually what we do. A lot. A lot of stuff to do something in the end that you know you can get push button solution, press play, and, and you're done. Uh, and that's us on a <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, next generation sequencing. Has anybody heard of this? None. Okay. DNA. Who's heard of DNA? Genes. Human Genome Project. Who's heard of that? Everybody. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, molecular biology, fantastic stuff. We were able to sequence single genes in a patient back in the uh, mid 90s, and now we're at a point where the chemistry and molecular biology is at a state where actually we can, you know, I can take a blood sample and I can actually assay pretty much all of your DNA. I can get a good look see at exactly your exact code of, of everything you carry in your cells at that time. And we can work out from that sequence where it differs, where it goes wrong, and how that contributes to your disease or doesn't or protects you from things. And that's kind of where we're going. And, and the, the idea then is, is basically to use this data to, they say this personalized medicine. It, it is literally revolutionizing uh, biology and medicine at the moment. We're at the cusp of something quite nice. In the next 10 to 5 years, you're going to see some really, really great stuff. Fingers crossed from the stuff we do and, and conceptually this is this is kind of what the flow looks like in our world we get patient data extract their DNA do some chemistry on it run it on a big fancy machine that's probably about half the size of this this table here and then we do this bioinformatic processing that's our <laughs> that's our job on supercompute and a pipeline or workflow looks like this kind of this is this is a, a very very pared down overview of kind of what we do 
get the raw data, stick it through uh, a suite of tools, basically, you know, a bash wrapper to pipe from tool A to tool B to tool C to whatever to get a final result, which is literally a, a report that goes to the clinician or a researcher to answer some questions. Um, and what's kind of caused a shift in, in our world is, you know, we were no longer dealing with small flat files. They're still flat files, but they're, they're big. So the amount of data these machines spit out, it's gigabytes per sample. And the machines are getting bigger and better. So the throughput and how much we can capture on an individual, it, it's, it's just it's skyrocketing to the point where some of the latest machines are spitting out 50 gigabyte kind of uncompressed flat files. And these are just text files with little strings of sequences. And the pipelines take that little string of sequences. There's millions of, you know, tens, 70, 100 billions of sequences now. And it's a sequence alignment problem. You throw that through your suite of tools, find out where it matches to the genome, a reference genome, and where it doesn't, and then say, OK, here's my potential mutations. This is interesting. It's not interesting. What do we do? So it gets repetitive. So it's that yak shaving. We sit down and we develop up pipelines. And, you know, it, we kind of, there are no, standard Docker images for a lot of tools we do. The bioinformatics world is very, very messy. Everybody's got the fav favorite language and they put, put out a lot of things that do the same thing in a different way in a different language. And half of our job is actually testing all that and seeing what works. So a minimal pipeline literally looks like this. We have some input and we pipe it through a suite of tools and we get a result to that variant annotation and that, that's a list of what we call in, in kind of the medical genomics world, actionable variants, something that we know exists in you that differs from normal that causes your disease or your diabetes or anything like that, stress, IQ-ish. Um, in reality, you end up, who hates BASH? I'm actually a fan of BASH. I love it, just, just for wrap, <laughs> wrapping things up. This is in reality what scripts look, <laughs> what some of our scripts look like. Um, this is a simplified workflow of what we're dealing with for next generation sequencing. Each of those black boxes is a tool written in a different language that does something slightly different to your data. Uh, each of those red boxes is an annotation database or the reference genome. So we download a reference genome, again, which is a giant flat file that contains all the ATCGs for every chromosome in your body. And it's a reference thing, and, and that gets big. And it's getting bigger as we learn more about us as, a, as, as humans and what we can do with DNA and genetics. Um, there's lots of problems in our world. Uh, a lot of research in clinical genomics, it's not reproducible. You have some guy sitting on his computer with his devved up pipelines, running these things on a machine that he's dealt with for years. He's got all his dependencies installed, he built it. He doesn't tell you what he's used to build it. And he builds a tool that does something. And everybody has their favorite language. All right, and there's different dependencies because they've done it on Ubuntu version whatever or CoreOS whatever, or even on Mac OS and some, some of the .NET guys have got things out there, and Java. So the biggest gripe I have now is, is the different Python versions and the different Java versions. Then Docker came along, and thank God for that, really. And then they seem to build in multiple options on tweaking each tool. So you can run a tool with 300 different ways of tweaking the gap open penalties and, and what you want to do and how you want to filter out sequences and your quality control sequence. And it, it, it is a nightmare. So you do spend a lot of time doing that yak shaving, testing the pipelines, tweaking the conditions of what happens. And I've just little dummy tool. We've got tool one written in Java version 0.6. Another tool written in Python, and another one that's actually a bash wrapper for a suite of Python tools and Java tools. And they have, and, and you know, I've said it's a, you know, it's a slight over exaggeration. It's not really. This exists. The number of options you feed into your Python tool, whatever, gets excessive sometimes. And some of it you don't need. And some of it, worst case, is not documented. And you email the author and you get, get no reply. And then the issues with the format, what you put in and what you com comes out. There's a new file format definition every year for, for some of the stuff we deal with. We're getting better because of projects like the, the uh, 1,000 Genomes Project and the 100,000 Genomes Project. They forced some standardization on us. Um, and there's thing, if you're interested, you can look at what a FASTQ or a PED or a VCF file is. Uh, again, they're just flat files uh, structured with metadata, literally um, position by position in your genome describing something. Uh, 
And this is it. And they, like I said, they get big and we're dealing with large files. And you know, when, if you're dealing with a few patients, it's fine. Uh, when you move to population level data, that gets excessive. Uh, you know, you're, you're pulling down 200 terabytes worth of data and doing something to it sometimes. Um, Bioparticians are really bad at documenting what, what they do, uh, putting out code that really doesn't work well sometimes. Um, and then there's this, and again, thank God for Docker. You know, so, so it, that came along. So NGS Easy, uh, Next Generation Sequencing Easy, we wanted to make the whole process of that pipeline easy for somebody who's doing basic research that doesn't have a, you know, a com computational biologist or software developer uh, set of skills to just pull a set of tools down, know that the pipeline works, and run it on any system. So far, I've had it running on a workstation with Mac and uh, Linux. Windows is <laughs> still a problem. Um, and it's, it's the same thing, that there are hundreds. This is a, a snapshot. It's just a cloud word of some of the tools that do maybe one or two parts of that pipeline I showed you. Um, everybody has their way to do, and we're constantly reinventing <laughs> the wheel in a bioinformatics world. Um, and like I said, about a year ago, Amos said, hey, look, Docker, play with it. So part of it, you know, there was a real research question, but actually we thought, oh, yeah, great stuff. Let's, let's, let's play with it. And as it evolved, you know, fantastic. There's no more, there's none of this anymore uh, with some of our research, research um, pipelines. What we're facing is actually a PR issue, is convincing the stuck-in-their-ways bioinformaticians to stop doing what they're doing and, and use Docker. Uh, package it up, and that's slowly happening. We ran an event at the Welcome about in November a couple months, months ago on bioinformatics and Docker, because we were Googling things, and we slowly saw, uh, saw the world kind of slowly doing the same thing, and, and bit by bit on GitHub, you'd see somebody with their code, and oh, great, there's a Docker file. Um, we reinvented the wheel. I've actually pulled in a lot of their tools and re-Docker filed it. Um, not going through this, not going through this. This is what we're aiming for. The clinicians and users, make it easy. They don't know what's going on in the back end. You can stand up your Docker pipelines anywhere. Stick it on HPC, Amazon, it's all good. Uh, and research, medicine, auditing. We need to know what's been done to the samples at any time in history for kind of real kind of tracking and reproducibility. Docker, Docker Hub, GitHub, all the things we use anyway make that possible. Um, and we're kind of, you know, we're, we're hoping as long as nobody, you know, Docker goes nowhere. We want to be in a situation where um, we can run an experiment now on some data and reproduce it 10 years down the line. So, you know, if a clinician comes back, I've seen X, Y, and Z in the patient, what did he do? Uh, here it is. Uh, it's on Git if you want to have a play. It probably won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we, just, we just put out a publication, and it was rushed, and I've, I've been, you know when you tweak? Um, <laughs> so it, it, it worked perfectly six months ago, but get, if you want to give it a go and get involved in the dev with us, please do. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to test stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, if you want to download 200 terabytes worth of human genome data, do it on your system, it's fine. Uh, Docker World, this is uh, pipeline options we're dealing with. Uh, Real world, uh, bash scripts, wrapping, tool one, tool three, whatever, output. Docker came along and you know, the Docker-esque approach was you know, a single application per container. But we were, that mess I was talking about for bioinformatics is, is the dependency. So actually we went, f you, know, you build a, a semi-monolithic container um, where each of these things do, do something. And actually each, what we have here is uh, within each base image is literally your, <laughs> your dev stack. So all the tools, you know, git, curl, web get. Python, Ruby, whatever in there, because I'm second guessing that bioinformaticians tool that needs that thing that I don't have, and then I'm back rebuilding them. Although it's quick, uh, you get lazy and actually want, you know, I just want to just pull it and run it, stick a new tool in a system I know where I have most of the stack ready, and get it going. Uh, Sorry, did you start at monolithic and then go to a single process? No, I, I started here. Start uh, had a nightmare because of the dependencies issues. Built a monolithic. Um, at the time, Docker Hub wouldn't accept my six gig uh, image. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went for a halfway house where, you know, th these are kind of slightly overweight images. Um, they're, they're, they're not monolithic. <laughs> so let's see. I think Docker Hub has changed, so I can push fairly fat images up now. Um, 
we'll see what happens. Uh, if you're not in our world, you don't need to worry about this. These are just some, this is a snapshot of the tools. We've actually dockerized close to 30 odd bioinformatics tools. They all work well. We're not basically going along the docker-esque um, approach. The fat and flat containers, I've, I've done some silly things where I've flattened the, the, the fat image to make it smaller for Docker Hub. That's going to change with the next version. Um, I'm a nice member of House of Bash. You've seen uh, Jerome's presentation. It works. And my, the scripts we have are actually quite verbose. So that part of the it not working now is I'm refactoring some of the, the script to make it slightly uh, you know, smaller and nicer to look at. Um, Docker, yes. Uh, right now, when we orchestrate things, I basically spin up a, an image and, and give it a name. And that name is to do with uh, kind of uh, what's happening at the time. So it gets the sample ID um, and the part of the pipeline that it's running so I can see what's going on. And then it just cleans it up afterwards. So that orchestration that way is actually just baked into the bash of Docker run, run when it's finished, remove it. I can remove it with the name that I tagged. That's very specific. You can have a look at my messy scripts and laugh if you want to afterwards. Um, not doing this yet, but it's something we want to have a look at with uh, Swarm and Kubernetes at some point where we get this into a real world NHS production environment where it's just sitting around waiting for somebody to throw data at it. Uh, not going to go through this. Uh, lovely bash. Uh, the reason why we went th down through some of this is um, the I.O. gets excessive with some of these files. Uh, and uh, some of the tools basically do annoying things where they spit out uh, a lot of temp files, you know, the same size as your original starting file. And to kind of get around some of that, some of the nicer tools allow you to pipe. And then there's suite of tools where we, we do something get a bog standard file, a kind of output of a list of variants of your human genome. And then you clean it up, piping it through a suite of tools. Uh, each of these tools um, basically involve downloading uh, one person's tool. And actually, what, what it is, is is a suite of 100 other uh, tools. So building 100 large uh, Docker images for each of these things is, was a no-go. It was just a, you know, a nightmare to organize. Uh, Yep, sales pitch I give to the guys we work with. It should work in any, on any workstation. It used to be any, any workstation, but I put in modern because we had students coming along complaining that their six-year-old laptop wouldn't run Docker. Um, and it's big, so we, we deal with big data so, and, and RAM intensive too for the next gen stuff. So it, you know, literally, it's not a hobbyist uh, pipeline. Um, you need a big compute. And you need lots of cores. If you, you know, some of the big data things now uh, that we're running in the past with old machines would take 24 hours. I'm now running that in three hours uh, just because of the increased RAM and, and number of cores and some of the tweak code. Um, supposedly easy to get. Uh, easy, easy. Uh, I'm not going to go through this unless you want to email me afterwards. Uh, this is the plan. So, <laughs> towards the end is getting all those images up and running in the back end and sticking a nice fancy GUI in front of it, uh, kind of to make things easy, kind of that seamless informatics that you, know, you don't want your end users to know what's going on unless they're interested. Just, just literally make it easy. Uh, in the past, you know, it took me six months to do an NGS project from learning it from scratch. What tools do I need to use? What tools are being produced? What's the best things to do? We've done that. We've taken the pain away for the user. Yeah. Um, and you've all come across this. <laughs> uh, how many people have had their Docker pipeline break because of the monthly update? Yeah, awesome. It's great. Uh, and there's this. You know, like it just solves so many problems with the mess that we have with software. Um, it's one way of doing it. It's all in Bash. There's some nice next-gen projects out there that people have written Python, but Python is just they're using that as a wrapper for the same set of tools that I'm using. Uh, and the idea, too, of, of us orchestrating in Bash is every system comes with Bash. You don't need Python version whatever to run your, your script. You have Bash, you have Docker, you're done. Uh, we ran an event in, in 2015, and I mentioned that, and got together some of the, the, the really great thinkers in bioinformatics who were using Docker. And it seems to be going elsewhere, our taskmasters.